this is all Rangers doing. Yeah. From day from day one, it's Rangers' fault. It's only two and a half million more than we were paying for strikers twenty five years yeah, ago. Yeah, glad he's in the door. Took far too long. Where's the rest of it? But. Melly, Stephen, just we thought we got rid of Atalanta and hope started to build a little bit for Matt <laughs> O'Reilly staying at Celtic. Um, as we sit here right now, formal approach from Brighton, It's this has got the sort of end of it feeling about it, doesn't it, a wee bit? Uh, it's, it's end of days, isn't it? Mm. We were looking at it at the weekend, me and you were talking at the, at the match, look, Southampton have brought in midfielders, Atalanta have went out and got another one. Maybe we're just getting them all off and then Brighton, uh, we're looking at the starting lineup at the weekend. They had James Milner starting in central midfield. They did get a big win, but you think they're probably going to want to improve there. And then and they come for Matt. And it's one of those ones where you look at it and go, aye, it's Brighton, but it kind of makes sense. Mm. It was all starting to feel quite good, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, as the more derisory bids were being flatly rejected by Celtic from Atalanta, you started to think, Maybe it's just not going to happen this window. Maybe it's something we can look forward to. We can get our team together. We can reject all bids. In fact, see we're a week to go. We can just say, we're not happy with the bids that have been received. He is not for sale. Mm. Big red letters, right? But then Brighton go and spoil it all by doing something stupid like <laughs> offering 28 million. Well, that, well, that was it. It. Atalanta's approach was very, very strange, wasn't yeah, it, Stephen? Yeah. I think it was in the end six bids. And that's, <laughs> that's, that's far really, too many. Well, it's far <laughs> too many and it's not really how football bids work, no. isn't it? Because usually what happens is a team will come in for a bid and go, give you 20 million. And then at that point, the selling team will either flatly say no, at which point then the, the agent kind of goes, by the way, it's 25 they want. Then the next bid is like 24 no, 25, you eventually get it. But this sort of 14, 16, 18, 20, 21. And I think their final bid was 25 million. Now, whether or not he wanted to move to Atalanta is a different story. But if Brighton come in and get him for 28, your Atalanta going, was it really 3 million the difference? Was that the deal breaker? Are you just not prepared to push the boat out that little bit more? But like Atalanta are well out of the picture. I think that didn't worry me as much as the Brighton one does. I think Brighton have spent got in a lot of money recently. Um, they ha tend to nurture these type of players quite well and make them make them before they make their next big move, Melly, and it seems annoyingly like a, a move that might appeal to Matt O'Reilly. Yeah, it looks like they're a team with a strategy, a transfer plan. They they make these signings and they kind of get them right a lot of the time because they bring in players that suit the way they want to play. And they do the same with managers as well, don't they? They just seem to be able to plug in and play when they bring in. They must have short lists all over the place. They look into this in depth. And see with Matt O'Reilly, you don't really have to look into him in that much depth, do you? You just see the quality of him. So you can understand why they'd want him. Uh, I wonder if Atalanta will just getting a bit of revenge on Celtic through an agent. Like, this is how Celtic play it. So just put <laughs> yeah. in wee bids. But... Look, it's unfortunate. I thought I made peace with it over the summer, but then when you see him play, you realise this guy's a great it's footballer. Yeah. I'd love to see him stay. And then when that happened at the weekend and we got to see him play against Hibs, he's, you're reminded how good he is and you think maybe there's a chance. And then Monday comes and you, you get the text saying Matt O'Reilly said he's his buys. I was like, ah, a lot of nonsense. A couple of hours later, Brighton came in. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> so uh, I hope it's not true, but I think... Like, it's difficult because we expected it to happen, but we're sitting here going, right, okay, Matt O'Reilly goes and there's nobody in to replace him, so that becomes our problem now. Would you make it a level, Stephen, because Brighton are a good team, yeah, but they're not like, they're no Champions League, they're, no, they're not going to win much, they're not going to push and get into the Champions League, are they? They're a sort of, they're a recycling team, they get good players in that do quite well for them and then they move them on, they're almost like what Celtic are trying to do, the English verse to that, and a part of me does wonder, you know, there's nothing really stopping Matt O'Reilly moving to that next level. I've been saying that for a long time. He doesn't need Brighton to get that next move because what are Brighton going to do for him that Celtic can't? Maybe a bit of Premier League exposure, maybe that. A wee bit more trust in the market might develop down there. But in terms of where you're going to play your football, I, I just, I, I'm not 100% disappointed, but I, I think like, I think Map could probably do a, a, a club of a better stature. Um, well, I, I suppose it depends how you look at it. Do we not do this every time, though? Do, yeah. we, do we not say that about Odson Edward? He could yeah. probably do better than Crystal Palace. Josip Juranovic could do better than Union Berlin. 
Ayer could do better than Brentford. None of them have done any better than those since they've, they've left Celtic. I'm not, I'm not saying Matt O'Reilly is any better or worse than these players, but we have had a lot of very good players through the door where we think they could definitely play at the top level and they never do. The only player that Celtic have actually signed to there or thereabouts the top level of football is Kieran Tierney. Mm. The rest have all gone to that. Well, maybe Moussa Dembele to Lyon when Lyon were, were doing quite well at the time they were in and around the Champions League. But the... These types of clubs like Brighton, like it or not, they're not as big or as storied a club as Celtic, right? But they have by far a better record as well as the likes of Southampton and Fulham of selling players, preparing and then selling players to the very top level. Mm. We might not like that. We might not like where we currently sit in the food chain or the ladder or whichever kind of analogy you want to put on it. But the likes of, so for example, Fulham and Crystal Palace have both sold players to Bayern Munich in mm. this window Celtic have never done anything like that so whether there is a little bit of trepidation a little bit of hesitancy from those clubs that we would prefer to see play players go to that seems to be the case you said there's nothing stopping Matt Riley going to one of these clubs well there probably is because none of those clubs want him for now if one of them did this would have been over weeks ago that well, one of these clubs would have come in and swooped in because if for example a, a more traditional big club that we perceive had seen Atalanta failing and failing and failing. What Brighton looked to have done here, if it goes through, is they've watched all this and said, well, if 28 million gets it done, we'll just do it. We'll mm. take them here and then get the deal done in like 24 hours. At any point, any of these bigger clubs could have swooped in and done this. It's the here and now though, isn't it? I think that's where it all hinges on because rewind the clock six months and a big, uh, bona fide, big, huge club was in for him in Atletico Madrid. It's yeah. just the timing and... I'm sort of reminded mainly what Brendan Rodgers says. He says, look, you don't have to move from Celtic. You can achieve almost everything you want to in your football career at Celtic. But Celtic just struggle to keep up with the financial element of it. And it's obviously a mat. I mean, with the best will in the world, you can sit there and say you're not money orientated. But if you're on 18 or £20,000 a week at Celtic, which is a massive amount of money, and a club at Brighton are going to come in and change your whole entire life and your kids' lives and your grandkids' lives with 60 grand a week, whatever you're getting paid or more... It's almost, I get it's almost impossible to turn down. I'm trying to fight Celtic's corner here whilst almost remaining realistic about the prospect we're facing in terms of what these guys can offer in wages. Yeah, look, wages come into it, but I think it's more Matt O'Reilly's again of a generation that's grown up watching the Premier League, hasn't he? And Brighton, as Stephen's saying, have become that team. If you were, if you were Matt O'Reilly's agent and you said, look, we've not got Man City, Arsenal, Liverpool coming in for you, so what's the next best thing? It probably is Brighton because they are sort of a feeder club for these teams. So look, wages will come into it. Matt O'Reilly is probably one of Celtic's highest paid players. But again, can achieve everything at Celtic. Uh, if I was Matt O'Reilly looking about, they're going, get a good manager here, get a couple of good players. But is this squad going to achieve anything in the Champions League this year? No, they're it not. And that Celtic could have done more to keep Matt O'Reilly for me. I think they've given him the contract last season. They've given him a platform. Have they given the manager the tools to say to players, look, you don't need to go. We can make a crack of this in Europe. Matt O'Reilly's played at Celtic for two and a half years. He's won six trophies. He's appeared in the Champions League on two occasions, two different occasions. What else can he do here? Looking about that squad, is this Celtic team going to go out and make a mark in Europe no so Celtic could have pushed it out is it worth him staying another year where this move might not come up or is it worth him going do you know what I'm going to be playing against the best players in the world in the best league in the world up against top quality every week is it worth staying for eight games to try and achieve that here I mean that is a conversation worth having Stephen isn't it what can Celtic do either in reality or in sort of fantasy football terms, what can they do to keep their best players? And I think Melly touches on something good. I wonder if there's... I, I mean, I, I know we're, we're sort of playing around the edges here, but I do wonder if there's an element of to convince these players to stay for one more year. Brendan said he wants to make a mark in the Champions League. He wants to have a crack at it. He said, those are his exact words. I want to have a crack at this Champions League. How do you do that when you're selling your best players? How do you convince players to stay, as Melly says, when uh, talent is thin on the ground at Celtic? If, do you think there's an, do you think there's an arg argument to say if Celtic truly looked like they were building something here? Because all the players will watch the news. They'll know Celtic got 100 million quid in the bank. Do you think if they felt like they were actually 
starting to build something that the club, the players, Matt, that that stay, Matt, and we'll try with the Champions League. It might be more convincing if Matt O'Reilly wasn't going to turn around and go, what's it all hinging on me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. is, 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 this, yeah. is this the plan? Is plan A convince Matt to stay and have a crack at the Champions League? What are we going to use him to stay? Having a crack at the Champions League? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it just like, a, is that the whole plan? Have we tried begging yet? Have we tried, <laughs> please just don't get like David Brent begging for his job at the end of the office. Like, I, I know we've been complacent, Matt, but I'll promise I'll try harder next time. I'll try. Brought Adam either. You like Adam? <laughs> Brought in Bernardo. <laughs> it's it's very very difficult. I have heard of cases that there there are quite none spring to mind specifically, but yet there are cases out there where clubs have convinced players to stay because they've been able to demonstrate a plan. Players have maybe said, well, if you bring in this guy, this guy, this guy, yes. I think maybe Harry Kane. Mm. Harry Kane was convinced yeah. to stay maybe a season or two more at Spurs because there was plans in place. Those never really came to anything, but he gave them a very long time and he gave them a lot of his career because I think he always believed they would win stuff there mm. and they never did. But I think if we'd been able to do that with Matt O'Reilly, maybe, I don't know, I can mm. only speculate, but if we'd been able to put a place, a demonstrable plan in place that showed we're really going to go for this. We're not going to win the Champions League, but we're really going to go for this. We're going to take a few scalps. We're going to give it a few black eyes. You're going to be the star player of this whole thing. Mm. And then the conversation we've just had, forget your Brightons and Fulhams yeah. and all that. Then you will get Borussia Dortmund or something like that. But we haven't been able to do that because we've not done any well, yeah. recruitment. And, and it not... sort of hinges on Celtic, doesn't yeah. it? Because uh -huh. you can't, have, Matt, just want to sit down and show you the presentation. And this is why you should stay. It's, it's called, we're going to make a crack at the Champions League. It's just Matt O'Reilly's face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's just me. Yep, you are our whole plan for this. Uh, you're going to ruin the whole thing believing that. <laughs> yeah. Think of all the little faces in the crowd. I was getting gubbed eight times in the Champions League without you. <laughs> and it is a difficult one, isn't it, Billy? Because, you know, we, we all like a grumble about the, the transfer window and Celtic's transfer dealings based on past history. And I know we've brought in Adam Eda in the space of flagship recordings. But you're like... If you go beyond that sort of start in 11, I mean, how do you even begin? How, like, so if the aim is to improve the team, right? And we all agree last year doesn't count because what you can't do is rip the guts out of the team so that the following year you can say, look, it's better. <laughs> like, because you, you ripped the guts out of it last year. So how do you, like, bring up... How, it's an impossible task to bring up the level of the team while selling Matt O'Reilly because that's... You've, you've set yourself back five steps there before yeah. you've even built on anything yeah and th that's the big problem we face isn't it that's taking what was it 18 goals and 18 assists out the uh, team from last mm. season so the way I would look at it we've mentioned it before is improve the rest of the team because we're never going to go out Brendan Rodgers said it we're never going to go out and get Matt O'Reilly again we'll get somebody younger or a different type of player so improve the rest of the team and Matt's probably looking about going not even started that <laughs> yeah, yet yeah, I know. And, um, so look Matt O'Reilly, the fee coming in for him should be enough to go, right, we need a left-back, centre-half, central midfield, or winger now, go out and get them all. But now you're in the position where Celtic are going to go all these clubs and they're going to go, they've just sold a guy for £28 million, plus they've got £100 million in the <laughs> bank. So see that fee you're giving us? Give us some more. And Celtic just go, don't know about that. So I think Celtic have got themselves into this position. We're now at the point, and we do it all the time, where a season or two ago, our best players were... Carter Vickers, Cal McGregor, O'Reilly, Maeda, Jota, and now we see we're chipping away mm. at that. And again, there's been nobody that's come in. Adam Eda might do that, that you think he's one of our best players now. So we've now got Starfelt's went, we've had Jota go, we've had uh, Matt O'Reilly probably now going, and you're looking about going, Right, Bernardo didn't play last year, but he's going to come in for O'Reilly. So it can't, that can't happen. Where do we go? Yeah. That, that can't happen. I mean, Celtic are, uh, Celtic are facing a massive task, but my worry, Stephen, is that we're just, this old phrase, we're chipping away at the squad. I think we've gone too far back now. Like the, 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 the Even the concept of getting players the standard of Starfield and Jota back, only left about 12 months ago. Yeah, yeah. Because, the, the, you're getting guys of that standard back is looking as if it's too difficult for Celtic. So to remove even more quality from the squad, I think is just, we're left on an impossible task. And I will be, I will note with interest, when or if Celtic do replace Matt O'Reilly or how they do spend their money because it, it does look like we have abandoned the transfer philosophy of last year of bringing in nine £2 million pound players, mm, you know, yeah. like these guys we brought in. I think, said it on Friday, didn't he? What did he say? He said that if I had £18 million to spend, I wouldn't want to bring in nine £2 million pound players. He said I'd want to spend 
six million on three players. Well, there you go, and that's abs- that. That's has to be. That's a guy who knows what eighteen million pounds looks like Aye. as well. We have to trust him <laughs> on that. His back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got you, you've got eight. I was noting with interest when I looked at Brighton's transfers. They're buying guys from the Swedish league for seven million euros and the Norwegian league for eighteen million euros. And you think they say, "Well, all right, so that's how much the good players <laughs> from that league cost." You're getting the crap from every, no, every market. I know we're Lager, no, Bielka, Holmes. I know there. we're not swooping in and finding gems for one point uh, four million. Well, the rest of them are jetting out the country for <laughs> tens of millions of pounds. I don't know what we think we're doing. Well, it's a conversation we had just last week, so I don't want to fully go back into it. But with the news now that Matt O'Reilly could be going, and as we sit here. It's not been confirmed. It's just we have been rocked by a, a big bid potentially coming in from Brighton. So it's obviously the first thing we talk about. Mm. But look, just last week we were talking about how look, Celtic are playing brilliantly just now. They're a joy to watch. The management seems to be getting the the best out of the players oh, after after a, a a struggle, a, a challenging season last year. Everything looks to be coming together, and we're going great guns in all mm. competitions. Hopefully, we can just charge on, win a win a treble a season, right? But we had the conversation last week about how. Yeah, but sometimes in games we do do look a wee bit light. We're looking at the bench and thinking, can we not so much improve the team, but even keep it at a decent Mm -hmm. level where you can maybe start to plug in players here and there, give them a rest. We're already looking very, very light in a lot of departments. To take Matt O'Reilly out of that is is desperate stuff, really. I think this whole window seems to be passing a lot of chat about Ida, a lot of chat about Mm -hmm. Bernardo, a lot of chat about Matt O'Reilly going... There are some positions in there which we could get into at some point, but haven't even been mentioned. There've not even been any links. There haven't been any, like no one's even asking Brendan Rodgers about centre halves and left backs and all that. And just a, a final thing on Matt O'Reilly, if we move away from that, it's I know we're joking about like begging him to stay and how he's like sitting here tapping the watch and all that. But we are genuinely begging it. <laughs> yeah, 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 we are. That that's not to imply that like he's he's been the ultimate professional yeah. here. He's still mm-hmm. turning up and playing very well in games for Celtic. Well, this is all going on in the background. He at no point looks like he's pushed for a move. And if I was going to be diplomatic about it and trying to be dick advocate as mm. we like to do on here there may be a case to be made that Celtic are selling him at the right time because yeah. his value is never going to be higher than this on an extremely long contract after the season of his life so I get that he is at his maximum value there might be a opportunity to keep him for another year and I'd love to do that but at the end of that I think he will be desperate to go because at the end of that the best we can really hope for is that he's maybe played a few games in the Champions League potentially won another treble it's more of the same right guys let me play the dick advocate to your dick advocate so so I don't but the, the problem here is that he might be at his maximum value, but the rest of the Celtic squad isn't. So mm. taking him out of that is perilous. Also, to... you're saying he might be at his maximum value. So, you know, if you say if we don't sell Matt O'Reilly now for twenty eight million, we might only get eight million. Uh, we might only get twenty million yeah, for him yeah. next year, right? Well, that's fine because one, we can't even replace him for eight million, <laughs> and two, we're not going to spend the money anyway. <laughs> yeah. So Matt O'Reilly's maximum value doesn't really mean an awful lot no, to me. No. It doesn't really carry any water. Uh, we need uh, Brendan wants power in the team. He's talked about that before. He wants a winger in the team. Is there anyone at Brighton that you would take? Uh, just for the, even for the banter, Martin Melly? James Milner? No, I was talking about uh, uh, Seema. Someone who knows the <laughs> league. Uh, uh, someone who European knows. experience. <laughs> <Imagine Yeah. laughs> that, that would be a terrific part of signing <laughs> if, we got, if we got him on a, on a deal back uh, up here. Um, we are being quite disrespectful. Celtic have spent some money. We went out and spent 8.5, depending on who you read, up to 9.5. I don't know. I'm not sure it was over nine million because I feel if Celtic broke oh, their transfer fee record, if they broke the the Edward nine million record, they would be very quick to tell us. So eight point five million for Adamida, it's it's looking a bit like a snip, especially when you look at the other transfers happening in England. I noticed with interest that oh, what was the boy's name? Skip. Oh, oh yeah, skip, yeah. yeah. 20 million quid and I read the comments beneath that and everyone's like daylight robbery I can't believe we've got 20 million quid for this guy and when I saw the comments relating around that transfer I thought to myself 8.5 million doesn't he sound half bad yeah it's good it's glad to have him in finally and he's the one we wanted didn't he getting him and Bernardo in was crucial to this was it so mm-hmm. we had to get it done pity it took to the middle of August to do it but we as get if by magic as Brendan <laughs> yeah, says yeah. we get there in the end and we've seen at the weekend how crucial it was because like Stephen said Kyogo's injured out for a couple of weeks to whatever it is uh, he's going to be out for Celtic are really Fred Bear in a lot of positions and it just shows you like Maeda had to play up front so James Forrest is out in the wide that's fine but then if one of them has to go off you're looking at 
you hang in pal, man. It's just it's just not it's not enough. So I think getting Eden was crucial. Took far too long. Mm. And if these deals really show what Celtic are about for me, two guys you had in the door on June the first took to the middle of August to get <laughs> that just sums up Celtic <laughs> in a nutshell. And we're doing it again here with Matt O'Reilly. Sorry to go back on that quickly, but oh come on in, Matt. We'll play you in the chat. You'll get into the Champions League. You can nearly get into your national team. Then you'll get a big move. Then when that comes, it's oh please don't go. We're not ready for it yet. As like Celtic, because mm-hmm. we've not got any replacements in. So getting Ida in was essential, had to be done. Got him in finally, but the problem again, I feel sorry for Adam Ida. He comes in and it's right, okay, where's the rest of yeah, it? Because it's taken that long that the transfer was so projected. Uh, when he came in in January, it was, how how's the process here led to this guy? Because Brendan Rodgers said, I knew about when Adam Ida said in his press conference, I got found out on the Monday and he signed it later that week. So glad he's in the door. Took far too long. Where's the rest of it? But because Celtic need reinforcements. It is a bit of a PR issue, isn't it? Stephen Celtic go out and spend 8.5 million on Adam Eder, but everyone's so frustrated about the lack of transfers. Like, <laughs> yeah. it, it sort of registers for a minute mm-hmm. and then immediately everyone's like, right, what else you got for us? <laughs> what else is unfortunate about it? Very unfortunate, in fact. Or is it unfortunate or is it exactly what we deserved mm. in that Kyogo gets injured where we've got one striker in the squad yeah. and then he does in basically a, a couple of days later. I'm... I'm, I'm Delighted that he does back. I think it's a great signing potentially because we've seen what he can do and any any notion to me that oh, there's better out there for the money is in itself a gamble because you don't know really mm. what, what does eight and a half million get you on the, the open market. I, I thought from day one when either came and there wasn't the, the buy option at the end of it, there wasn't any fee discussed, I thought he's going to be the guts of 10 million. I don't yeah. think Norwich are going to sell him for any less than that because he's, he's like O'Reilly is in a good position or the selling club are in a good position because he's on a long-term contract. So to get him for eight and a half, it really is, It's again, it's a perception thing because I think in Scotland we're conditioned to thinking, wow, that's that's ridiculous. Mm. What a complete, like callous waste of money that is. But I mean, that's that's what you need to pay to get very good players in the door. People and, forget so quickly, don't yeah. they, about these fees. I saw a lot of commentators talking about how 8.5 million, a lot of pressure on the guy to perform. He needs it. And I thought, well... Oh, Rangers spent six million on Daniel not <laughs> last, right, yeah. last season, and the guys barely kicked a ball. Celtic spent seven on Julian. Yeah. Nobody talks about that. Six and a half for Jota and six odds for Carter Vickers. Was that like nobody really? It's it's these transfer fees. They've decided because it's eight point five million. But when you're talking about one point five million more than Christopher Julian cost Celtic, it's not really that shocking or startling a fee. No, no if if. If Ida came in, if Ida hadn't signed in January and he came in right now for eight and a half million, people might go, don't know about mm. that. But then if it, in the first six months of the season, he bag goals at Fur Park, Easter Road, Kilmarnock away, scored twice against Rangers, you'd be like, eight and a half million's nothing, is it? Because you're getting a guy that's scoring big goals in big games. And that's what we've got. We've got something different. We were always desperate for that. Celtic worked well when they had... Kyogo and Giacomacchus because when it came to big games whether it be Champions League or Rangers Kyogo missed a few Champions League games didn't you thought oh sorry Giacomacchus will mm. play whereas last season it was oh and you're like I'm not sure about that and uh, this season well Kyogo's injured right fine Adam Eda will play just we don't have that depth anywhere else in the squad and that's where the, the problems start to lie but delighted for him as well I think he tried to make the move yeah. as, as much as possible. It was and I him think... that knocked off that extra million quid for us, wasn't it? With <laughs> yeah. his See, insistence. On the, on the fee as well, it's only two and a half million more than we were paying for strikers 25 years yeah, ago. Yeah, well, that's well, very true as well. Aye. And that, that kind of thing comes up. It's like, oh, I remember the days we used to get Chris Sutton for six million. Aye, but today you would get, it would be 40 million for yeah, Chris Sutton. Yeah. Now, do you think, like, if, well, granted he was a bit of a flop at Chelsea, but do you think they'll sell... Romelu Lukaku for six million today, or will it? Or will they hold it for there probably must, sixty? There must be some bargains to be had down Stamford Bridge way. Oh. Surely, <laughs> all these players just pissed off and releasing <laughs> statements and looking for loan moves. Brendan will know some of them. We played them yeah. in the summer. Brendan will be, you know, that wee guy peeking out behind the tree. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. That'll be Brendan looking with his wee fingers looking at the Chelsea squad. I saw it. I saw it today. They were, they were linked with a, a shock move for Raheem Sterling after he issued a statement about being upset about being left out of the Chelsea game because he knows Brendan Rodgers. Click the link. That there's my first mistake, yep. and it was Jeff Sterling saying, uh, "Someone's someone's written here, 
should Rangers sign Sterling? I'm, I'm not even going to finish that. Should they go to Celtic though, Ali? Ali says, no, I don't, probably not. He'll probably go to Saudi Arabia. That was the whole story. <laughs> there's, a, there's a there's a real problem at the moment, isn't there? We're transfer waffle on the <laughs> yeah, internet. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. And it's even one gets you when one of these websites gets you <laughs> and you have to scroll past <laughs> the eight adverts no. just to see. It's like super starlet moves from Glasgow to London. And you're like, well, have I missed something here? And then it's like, what's his boy? Liam something. Oh, my other. cookies. Daniel Kelly. Daniel <laughs> Kelly <just> went, <laughs> to, went, to, went, to, went to Millwall. Oh, great. Got me again. <laughs> Hey. <laughs> R.I.P. my cookies and search history. But that's how desperate we are for rumours. Uh, that's, yeah. that's how desperate it is. Mel, you said we're a bit short in depth, but I thought Dyson did well uh, filling in at centre half. Centre half? Well, centre forward. <laughs> I'd rather him play there than scales. <laughs> oh, oh. Uh, it has to get his scales <laughs> digging. It's still there. Uh, it was great. Uh, it's what we, we know we can do. Sometimes you kind of worry in these games that the, the Hibs defence is just going to sit in. They didn't really sit in or they didn't push up. They didn't know what they were doing and Maeda can do that. And when he's got those early balls, the ball from Kuhn for the second goal over is absolutely brilliant. And you could just see MDLs, he's kind of like the day I got for me where players would play passes that they would never play at MDLs mm. because of the sheer pace of the guy that they can do that. So he got that touch for the second goal. First goal was a striker's goal as well. That's where you want it may be. So I filled in lovely there, but... Uh, going forward, do I see him doing it regularly? No, but if on occasion, I think it's that third striker that we've talked about. I don't really see Celtic going out and get one. Why not? Because we need about four or five other players. Mm. But I just don't really, Stephen Mayer spoke about it, don't see that position f for MD. MD over the age of 20, who's going to want to come and be yeah. a third choice striker? Where you Look at all last season, barely got on the bench most of the time. So Didn't he get a tracksuit on after February, I don't nah. think. Oh. And I think we're football nowadays players are adaptable so if Dyson can play right left and up front he's invaluable to Celtic because he's absolutely brilliant and he had the you bored puppet <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to chip away expectations he's like a new here. signing up front oh, no. says influential podcast well, he's changed his hair yeah. colour he's like a new signing <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to chip away at the expectation here so we're, we can get free players in and I'll be happy but I done well up there absolutely brilliant could have had a hat trick there was you seen the best and the worst of him with the two goals and then there was another one came over the left-hand side and he takes this touch on his head past the defender. Mm. Your like, oh, he's in. Second touch takes him miles away. But I love the guy, man. He just epitomises pure chaos and I love it. <laughs> it he's, I mean, we say it all the time about Dyson, but there's genuinely never been a player no, that I've seen no. a player like. He's, a, he's iconic and he looks really comfortable with that centre-forward role as well. Yeah, and it's a main, the main reason I thought that it's come up a, a couple of times because Brendan Rodgers put it out there about this third striker position. That, that's why I wasn't really concerned about it. There's stuff I'm very worried about mm. in terms of the squad depth. Can Thirds I just cut across you quickly, though? Because Brendan Rodgers said about the third striker and then he said about, you know, if I've got 80 million to spend, I want to buy three players and not 10 players. Yeah. And then he said about Matt O'Reilly wants two players. Didn't he? he said he wants two other midfielders? If and Matt O'Reilly goes, he wants two midfielders. He said he wants two midfielders if Matt O'Reilly goes. Then you rewind the clock uh, a week ago and he said, I don't want to get bogged down in the toxicity of transfer <laughs> stuff by putting numbers on things. That's Do you strange. remember? That's a lot of numbers. And now he's like an auctioneer. Brendan's been brilliant recently. By uh, he's, he's gone office. full Brendan. We, we can possibly talk about, about that. Well, let's but, just do it right now. Yeah, oh, well, just to, to finish off on that, just to finish off on Dyson, the, the third striker thing was never a priority for me because I, I didn't think anyone would get in there ahead of Dyson. So, for example, had... Rocco Vata stayed or Celtic had replaced him with another teenager. That game comes around, Kyogo's injured, Adamida has just signed a couple of days before, mm. so he's not fully fit. There's no way he, some young guy plays in, up front ahead of Dyson. He's always going to be that choice, which is why I was relaxed about that position. He's very good up front. The point has been made that he plays regularly up there for Japan at, at very high levels. He's done it for Celtic before. And do you know what? He's a good striker yes, as well. He is, he is, because I look back at, I think that's, I heard in commentary that's 30 and 31 goals he scored for Celtic now, which isn't a huge amount because Kyogo did that in one season and more. But I think back to some of his goals, some of the, the finishes he's had, that's not the it's not the work of just this kind of headless chicken blunt instrument that yeah. people imply is, or he just runs, he just presses and all that. He, the guy's a very talented footballer and a, and a decent finish at times. M certainly more erratic than Kyogo and even Adam either, but he's a good finisher at times as well. Now, Stephen, you mentioned box office, Brendan, and I think <laughs> yeah. it's it's well worth bringing people up to speed. So, 
Brendan had a lot to say, or well, a little bit, but straight to the point about the ticket fiasco uh, over Ibrox Way. And I don't know what's happened to Rangers over the summer. I really don't. They have turned into a complete clown car <laughs> <laughs> with bits yeah. falling off left, right and centre. A, and I, I a clown running across a minefield. I, I can't <laughs> quite believe it. I just don't understand the approach that Rangers have taken. Now, far be it for me to give Rangers advice. But one, if you come close to winning the league, then why would you dismantle that team and say, well, rebuild a better team than this one, the best one they've had in a very long time, once we get all that Champions League money <laughs> and then get battered out the Champions League <laughs> by, by Kiev. You know, and the very next day, Clement's like, ah, I see that rebuild thing we were talking about. I might need to wait a wee bit longer. Yeah. So then after all that happens, they get battered out the Champions League. It's one thing after another for Rangers last week. Everyone's sort of laughing at them except them. Um, BBC Sports Sound who were adamant it was the referee's fault um, <laughs> <laughs> even Alan Hutton even daring to say the referee should never manage in the Champions League ever again <laughs> exact words was it Derek Ferguson just outright called him a cheat yes uh, right. and Kenny Mack says no you can't say that he's not a cheat he's incompetent and I think yeah. to myself is that just insults reserved for foreign refs are yeah, we going to yeah. hear some of that this season because there's plenty on show already Anyway, fast forward a couple of days and Rangers are thinking, right, well, all that's over. No one's talking about us anymore. And then it comes to transpire that there's no away fans as agreed coming to Celtic Park next week. Yeah. Because, lo and behold, Rangers have not kept up their end of the bargain as far as fan safety and access and egress and all that sort of stuff comes into it. Now, Melly, I was originally of the approach just give Rangers the tickets. Give them the tickets and see what happens come January. And then if they still don't fulfil it, then we've still got two fixtures we can say, look, these guys are making an absolute arse of it and we did our bit and it's their fault. And, you know, plus we've said on this podcast before, it's quite nice having Rangers fans in Celtic Park when you beat them. And, oh, I, yeah, and I feel yeah. very, very confident we're going to pace them in a couple of weeks, right? That'll be good. <laughs> right. So, but then Brendan sort of changed my mind, Melly, when he said, and he reminded me, this is all Rangers doing. Yeah. From day from day one, it's Rangers' fault. So we're doing everything we need to do to come to some sort of agreement that we didn't really want in the first place. And you have made an arse of it again. Yeah, you didn't even mention that Rangers employed some Celtic fan for a couple of days and had to give him the oh, that's as right. Well. So <laughs> good week, lads. But uh, yeah, look, uh, Brendan, that guy might listen. <laughs> uh, when I got home on Friday, I uh, went to watch the presser and I seen it was 20 minutes long. I was like, oh yes, here we go. He'd obviously heard what he said and like, didn't he leave MD with any doubts what mm -hmm. happens? And it's, sometimes it's, look, he, he is an employee of the club, so he's got to sort of toe the party line, but also he's just reminded us like, aye, this is nothing to do with us. Mm. Celtic have done what they have to do. I seen the stairs and all that they've built uh, at the away end as well, all there, all ready to go. So Celtic have done that, that that can get shut off. Rangers don't even know where they're going to be. And it, mm. like, I, I get it as well. I want fans back. Not not so much for Rangers fans to be there, but for us to have the chance to go to Ibrox. Like there's generations that are going to go through not having the chance to go to Ibrox. It's brilliant. It's the best thing when you see your team win there and they're taking that away from people and Brendan just came out and said kind of what we all feel I, I, I'm a bit tired of it and I was like just get the fans back but from Celtic's point of view what have we done wrong mm. absolutely nothing we're trying to do this we're again going to the negotiation table saying right if we can get this in place can we at least get 3,000 I think it was and we just can't even do that they can't even get that together so it was quite right to come out and do it we get sick and tired of it this old firm or Celtic Rangers problem mm. it's always portrayed and he was like it's not a problem for Celtic it's a Rangers problem it has been from the start they took the huff because they were getting scunnered with us having a party all the time and this is <laughs> that's it's not done. Brendan's quote the no. first part was Brendan's <laughs> quote the second part but Stephen just see all this stuff about allocations just briefly expanding the conversation a wee bit this stuff about allocations it's that we saw it with Hibs last week we're seeing it with Rangers this it's Tin pot as it gets. Aye, aye. And it's better have cut the allocation for Sunday. It's really, it's, it's pathetic, man. It's All it is is football fans wanting to go and watch their team. And why are we letting fans of, why are we letting the fans of these clubs or why are fan, clubs letting their own fans go, I don't let Celtic fans in? Why? Would aye. you rather there are no seats? We saw how that worked out for St Mirren in the last set of financials. They're swimming in debt. It's because they don't want to sell tickets across the league. 
I think it's really by time we all need to sit down and say absolute minimum 10% of yeah. the stadium or 15% of the stadium. No ifs, no buts. That's the minimum. And if you want more, that's fine because it's, it's Stephen, it's cringe. No, oh, <laughs> it's absolutely cringe. And it is, I think it has become one of the most tedious and boring subjects in Scottish football history. Mm -hmm. it genuinely, my heart sinks every time this comes up because we were having a chat about it in the group chat that we... We were talking about what to talk about in podcasts, and I'm just like, guys, I, c I can't talk about this again. Yeah. <laughs> this wasn't ahead of today. This was last week when this subject was getting spoken about again because I just find it embarrassing now, to be honest. And I've, it's almost like me not having a position on it has become my position on yeah. it. It's just I'm just like I'm so bored of this stuff from Rangers, and they've they've set about. It's always them, isn't it? Yeah, they tipped over the first domino that is set about sort of eventually making Scottish football even more tin pot than it already was. Now, Scottish football, we all love it. We talk about it on a daily, ba well, near daily mm. basis. And but we're, we're realistic about it. It doesn't have that many things going for it in terms of like, comparisons, unfortunate comparisons with other leagues. And we've just done it quite yeah. a lot tonight as well. But one thing it did have was... That bogus per capita stat. Yeah, well, there's that as well. But do you know what? It's, it's at its core a passionate football country. I don't mm. think anyone can deny that. But now we're gradually just chipping away at the fan experience bit by bit yeah. by bit. And now, what is it we're actually left with as a spectacle that Scottish football? We don't have away fans at grounds in it. Or we'll, if people get their way, we won't have any away fans at grounds in, in the next couple of years. It's right. it's mortifying. And even watching games as a televised, televisual spectacle, yes, we, we had the discussion about Hibs fans closing off sections instead of selling the tickets, but even their sections are dead. Yeah. Like you can... You, any televised game in Scotland, it's, like, you know, it's just massive empty stands populated by the odd sparse group here and there. The clubs, the chairman should say to these fan groups, right, we won't sell the ticket as long as you promise you'll buy it. <laughs> yeah. Because I, there's nothing worse, as you say, than you watch the TV and there's these empty stands everywhere. Now, just turn it back to the Celtic Rangers thing. Look, we've had some amazing experiences at Celtic Park. You know, the whole ground is yeah, just watching yeah. Rangers get absolutely battered into the ground. One of the ones I remember distinctly is that 3-0 game the nighttime game yeah. that that was absolutely brilliant but that's things you can do if there's no fans but they don't that seem to accommodate that element of the fan experience you, you don't have to have if there's no Rangers fans in the ground you don't have to have 12 o'clock kickoffs anymore you just have it at 3 o'clock you can have it whenever you want you can have it at night because there's not that mixing of fans that is probably going to cause trouble you can sell beers at the game because it's all Celtic fans like there's things you should be able to do if you're going to make it where away fans are pretty much a thing of the past, then then cater towards the home fans a wee bit. Yeah, I, ab absolutely. There's there's so many possibilities, so much potential there that is just going unrealised mm. all the time. And I, I remember I remember being at the game where in Cham scored the winner, it was just 1-0 at yeah, Celtic yeah. Park years ago now. And the game finished and quickly a message kind of spread through the section I was sitting in at the time that, you see, if we don't leave, it means the Rangers fans can't kind of leave here. <laughs> so they just sort of sat back down and kept, kept singing. It was, it was absolutely brilliant. But uh, yeah, it's it's an incredibly tedious subject now, and it has become embarrassing. It's now going on for years and years. And I, I understand that people are have reservations about letting certain fans into their into their ground because there's trouble and, and so on. But we do need to get sort of get around the table and work out what exactly the future of Scottish football is going to look like because it can't be this. It can't no, it, no. it genuinely can't be. And it's it's just become so tit for tat. And I understand Celtic's position on it as well because they can't be seen to be seeding ground to, to Rangers if the fact that they can't guarantee anything but and that's another problem with the right everyone needs to agree to a percentage of the ground Rangers don't <laughs> they don't know where they're going to be playing yeah, uh, from, from one month to the next but for, back to Brendan Rodgers on it I thought he was excellent mm. uh, and he's very very good at this kind of thing we all love uh, like kind of making fun of Brendan's persona that he gives off he's kind of box office Brendan yeah. and all that right the Gucci belt all that sort of stuff we all love all that thing but see to be fair to him he may well have embellished a little bit of romantic Celtic twaddle over the over the mm. years to you know we know all the stories but now but in stuff like this he's very direct he's very down the line and he's very upfront about what he believes in these things and he, he's good at sticking up for the fans and the club as well, but he doesn't stick up for either one of those when he doesn't feel it's warranted. I mm. remember him, he's had several goes at the club for their, their transfer activity. And I remember him being absolutely furious when there was a Champions League game last year, I think it was, and 
the fourth fan ran on the pitch and Brendan was Aye. absolutely seething. He was like shouting at him and all that. So he's not he's not the type to just pander to any side of this debate for the sake of it. When he goes out there and speaks to the, the media and therefore the fans, he's very direct about it and he's very, very sensible when it comes to these these positions and he's backed up the fans and the club in this regard. And it's about time someone said it because part of the reason I feel, or I, I find this stuff so tedious is I cannot be bothered with it. Oh, you're to blame, you're to blame, you shat it, you shat it. <laughs> it's yeah. ridiculous that we've allowed it to be yet another one of these Scottish football, both sides of the same coin, two cheeks of the same arse stuff. Yeah. It's what not, was that it's iconic Rangers. Celtic tweet? What was the tweet the Celtic tweet? Oh, we're not half of anything. Not our it? problem. Yeah. They should have just recycled that. Yeah, that would Because that tweet yeah. has now become iconic. Now, just before we go, Nicholas Kuhn, keep up the good work. We see you. We're <laughs> impressed. You're doing very, very well. A... Uh, Patreon.com slash 20 Minute Tims if you want to support us. Lots of content coming up. It's a big time for Celtic. Transfer windows, Champions Leagues, Rangers games. Find it all on Patreon.com slash 20 Minute Tims. See you next week.